Waking it. So, here we are with uh, Simon McCartney, all the way in Hong Kong. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. You're welcome. We're uh, really excited to have a chat to you, Gareth and I. I uh, love a good adventure story with lots of twists and turns. And when we heard your story, we really, really wanted to have a chat to you. Uh, and you were kind enough to send us a copy of your book and, uh, uh, called The Bond. Uh, and we really, really enjoyed it. We were very much enthralled by the events that unfolded in the book. Uh, and Simon, tall buildings these days of Hong Kong have replaced tall snow-capped mountains in your life. We would like to get to know the man. Yes. <laughs> We'd like to get to know the man behind this nail-biting story. So take us back to your youth and uh, how did you actually get into climbing? My father um, has got to take the blame for that. He um, wanted to make sure that uh, I was getting enough adventure, I suppose, as a young guy. And um, unwittingly, he tipped me into rock climbing, which you know, there's not a genie in every bottle, but he found one in me and. Uh, I became completely besotted with it, you know, from, from, from the off. I started climbing when I was about 13 years old, probably. And a little crag near London called Harrison's Rocks, where, where many people have started. Um, small, grotty sandstone cliff, but, but very, you know, athletic climbing. And um, it changed my life as a kid. You know, I didn't hang around and play football at weekends with my pals. I, I, I went to North Wales and, to Scotland if I could get there or, you know, as far away from my home in London as I could manage. Come home late on Monday morning for school. Uh, it became the thing that drove my teens. Uh, that's cool. And then I think climbing is like, you know, it's like quite a tribe of people that are pretty close together. Um, how did the older guys take you in and, and was there much banter between you and them? You know, it is very tribal and, and Alpinism still is. I mean, climbing's huge today. It's quite a commercial industry almost. But uh, at the, the sharp end of climbing, it's very tribal. And um, yeah, there is that. You know, I, I managed to persuade my dad to send me to North Wales at the age of 15. I went there for the whole summer. And I wound up, you know, being uh, used as a, as a belaying device by some of the hardest, you know, <laughs> mean rock climbers in, in Lambaris, uh, you know, who, who would always make sure that I was all right and, uh, you know, didn't get thrown out of the pub for underage drinking. And, you know, one by one, they dragged me up the hardest climbs in North Wales. So it was a great education. It really was a lot of fun. I got to see um, things that I might not have for years were it not for that happy sort of crazy summer. Wow. And now the, uh, I guess you must have met a lot of interesting characters along your way as well, but why is climbing considered to be a sort of a cerebral kind of a sport? Well, you know, you can kill yourself doing it, and it's a question of skill avoiding doing that. Um, and it's as much a mind game as it is a, is a physical game, and you obviously need to be strong, you need to be agile, but you can assume as much risk as you, as you want or not. Um, and, you know, that's the game you play in your head, you know, your hands and feet. Well, that's just the physical thing, but it's where, whether you're prepared to commit yourself to, um, to the next hard move, not knowing how it will turn out. Climbing, you know, then is very different than it, than it is popularly now. Uh, we never used expansion bolts or pitons in Wales, you know, and you could fall to the ground if the equipment you were replacing didn't work for you, whereas today most climbing is sport climbing. And the risk of injury is, is absolutely minimal, if not non-existent, really. Um, so we were what we call trad climbers these days. We didn't have a word for it. We were just climbers. And we were prepared to take risks, and mm. we did. Yeah. So that's, that's, yeah. That's the game. There's also the one-upmanship and the rivalry that goes with it. You know, it's quite a complicated game. Yeah, it certainly is a treacherous thing when you when you're looking at it from the outside that's for sure and i was listening to your podcast that you did and i was like so intrigued by it and but also like i'm like i get so like nervous just listening to to some of these <laughs> adventure stories but simon it's actually quite nice maybe to just provide a couple of definitions like around so climbing so there's a difference between rock climbing alpinism and mountaineering is can you distinguish those for us please yeah, I mean, uh, to be a mountaineer, you need to better do everything. 
um, because you'll encounter mountains that are made of ice and rock at high altitude. You need all of the skills. Um, but some people choose just to be rock climbers. You know, there, there are a whole tribe, another tribe, you know, in, in California that like to climb in Yosemite Valley in the sun, you know, and they're incredibly athletic but they don't really put themselves at any risk of being frozen to death or, you know, it doesn't get cold. There, you know. So they're, they're rock climbers that become specialists. To my surprise, you know, bearing in mind, I, I walked away from climbing in 1981 and never looked back until circumstances caused me to write that book. So I got a 30 year uh, coma, you know, and I, I came back to climbing and <laughs> seen changes that, that just horrified me, you know, that, that, <laughs> that there are people now that say, oh, I'm an ice climber. I'd say, well, say, what? You, know, you only climb ice? Like, what do you do in the summer? You know, um, and it, that's how it's gone. It's gone very fractured and, and specialised. Um, you know, I, I never thought to regard myself as anything other than a climber. I could do anything. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah, wow. climbing in big mountains in Alaska for sure. You have to have every skill available to you, you know? and, um, and just survival is, is one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess the, 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 you would have considered yourself just a mountaineer then you, you were taking on whatever was thrown at you and yeah I mean I loved rock climbing it was fun and it was competitive um, and you could certainly hurt yourself back in the 70s and 80s um, but for me it was always just training for something bigger you know, it was, in the end it was the big mountains that really beat me and uh, you know, that's where I wanted to go my first Summer in the Alps in 1977, I went, oh, 76, actually. I went, yeah, this is it. I, I want to climb things that are, you know, 12,000, 14,000 foot high, and I want to spend the night on them, and I want to be tested in every way. Um, you know, you, you do it three or four ice climbs in a row, I think, well, now I want to do a rock climb. You know, it's, it's, it's that's what it was. So, yeah, I learned to climb ice in Scotland when I was a teenager, um, and that was just a skill that I put to use on, on much bigger mountains later on. And what was the climbing like in the UK, actually? Sorry, yeah. Pretty soggy. Um, the weather's not so great in the UK, and, and most of the mountains are, are rain magnets. Um, Scotland <laughs> was always, always the worst, and I think it put me in great stead because you, know, you drive all the way to Scotland, and the petrol was expensive. Um, <laughs> and the weather would be foul when you got there, you know, because the weather forecasting wasn't great. So we just used to go climbing in storms anyway. Um, and as a consequence, we became very good at the keeping warm when it was extremely windy and cold and also began to navigate really well um, because we had to. Um, and, you know, Scotland's you might think, well, not a dangerous place at all, is it, Scotland? But the weather in, uh, in Glencoe, you know, if it really goes bad in the middle of winter, it can be horrendous. Just finding the road, you know, that you started from could be an epic. <laughs> you know, I really think that stood me in good stead. You know, we rescued some people in uh, 1970. Uh, 1977 from the top of Mont Blanc and it was in a howling storm and you know it was just that Dave and I were that familiar with being in dreadful weather that, that um, it didn't face us much. So, so, Simon just uh, just before you get onto that that mission that rescue bit of the rescue mission you did now but can you can you just tell us a little bit about where this determination within you came to do these climbs like and you know because it's I guess as a youngster like this is these are hard things to do. So, you know, what was it like your upbringing that brought, you know, made you like this? I don't know. Um, I, obviously, it, it, my father was a great influence. I mean, he used to take me to Scotland and we would go mountain hiking, you know, from the age of about 11. But it was pretty gnarly for 11, 12-year-old, you know, to, to be out 30 miles you know, in a day, up and down. Um, so, you know, he was, he was a pretty tough guy, my old man. Whether it came from there, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, obviously, I'm determined, um, and you have to be. Um, otherwise, you know, well, if you weren't determined, you wouldn't be a climber. I don't think that you, you, you'd find something else to do with your, mm. your life. Yeah, yeah. So I've, got, I've got no real clear answer for why I am like that, but I'm just a pig-headed or stupid. <laughs> <laughs> An equal amount. Why not that problem? Oh, well, but well, we're glad you are because you have a great story. So that's, that's yeah. <laughs> and you, you spoke now about uh, climbing uh, Mount Blanc and uh, that was, I think, in preparation for another mountain that you were going to climb. But uh, when you were in, on Mount Blanc, it ended up being a bit of a, a rescue mission of sorts, didn't it? Yeah, I was climbing with a guy called Wilkin, Dave Wilkinson. He was much more experienced than I was. But there again, I was 
you know, younger and fitter, you know. So we made a very good fit, you know. He had the brains and, you know, he'd let me out of the, the box like a trained monkey if we got to something that was really <laughs> athletic, you know. Um, I enjoyed his company enormously and um, we had a fantastic season. We tried to climb the north face of the Eiger, but the weather wasn't cooperating, um, you know, and to have done that as a, as a 19-year-old would have been quite something then. Um, and we found ourselves, uh, you know, in Chamonix, we made many climbs. And the last one we did was a, a second ascent. Um, Chamonix's been popular for a very long time and Mont Blanc was climbed in hundreds of years ago. Um, so all of the good stuff's been climbed, you know, that any unclimbed ridge or, you know, gully that has beautiful all this, you know, someone's done it. So we were resorting to making second ascents of things. We made the second ascent of uh, the central pillar of Bria. Uh, which was a magnificent rock climb, but it finishes uh, up a ridge to the summit of Mont Blanc. And you've got to cross Mont Blanc from the Italian side to get down into France. Um, all mountains have an easy way up, usually. And the trick is to climb the hard side and then go down the easy way. So we were headed for the, the tourist trail, basically. And the weather went went to pieces on us on the last day. I mean, it really, uh, a really big storm kicked in, uh, you know, maybe 60 mile an hour winds and mm. total white out snowing and so on. The temperatures dropping because the wind chill it becomes incredibly serious. You know, it might be minus only might only be minus twenty, but if the wind is affecting that it, it'll feel much colder. And we found six people. We found two um, two Austrian people who dug a hole to get out of the wind and I only just passed by them by pure luck. Mm. And they heard 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 me coming shouting between Dave and I because we were you know navigating using the compass and the rope. I'd, I'd make a sort of like a snow plow and walk out 50 feet or so until he couldn't see me anymore. And he'd tell me to walk on a certain bearing and you know, then we'd do it again. And, do it. <laughs> and um, I found these people. And uh, they were in a pitiful state. Uh, they'd been yodeling at us the day before from another, <laughs> another ridge, but they were really cold and, and frightened. And a um, couple. So, they, you know, hang on a minute. You know, we, we, can we come with you? Can we come with you? I said, where are you going? Said, we're going to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, wish I, hadn't, I wish I hadn't made that joke because the poor woman's face just, it, it, <laughs> you know, being rescued by an idiot, you know. Or, or, <laughs> but anyway, soon enough, they were plodding along behind us and, um, you know, we're now up to our, our waist in snow almost. And it's really hard work for me because I've got to go fast at first and break it down. And then blow me down. You know, there in the snow, I find another four people. I could just see a, you know, glint of colour. And there's four French people sitting uh, in, in, with their backs to the wind, sitting in a row, you know, slowly freezing to death. And uh, they didn't see me coming, and I thought it was hysterical uh, as a 19-year-old as a to walk up to the last guy and tap him on the shoulder and him not realise that anyone was there, you know. Then he jumped out <laughs> in. And, you know, oh, where are you going? We're lost. <laughs> We're very cold, you know. In French, all this is going. Kind of, my French is pretty terrible, but we can talk about things like that, you know. Where are you going? So I tried the pub joke again. And he got this time. He got it. You know, I named him. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, "Oh, you know the way." And I said, "Mate, it's on the map." You know, really. Come on, <laughs> and then we had an anxiety attack on top of the mountain. I found the summit, and I just wanted to make sure, for sure, that it was really the summit because it's, it doesn't have any marking on it or anything. It's pretty featureless, round dome. I was walking around just to make sure that was the highest bit, and it was, and then set off on what I knew was the, you know, westerly direction straight down to Chamonix and the big anxiety attack. Oh, what was that summit back there? You know, we were on the wrong mountain. We're all going to die. <laughs> and Dave pulled them all together. He just, just wouldn't have any of it. He said, look, you know, you can stay here and die. You can come with us. And that was the end of it. <laughs> that was the language. They followed us. <laughs> um, and we found a hut that we were looking for without much uh, ease, actually. It was very hard to find it, but we did. And dragged them all indoors. It was full of British soldiers when we got there, um, which was amusing and ridiculous all at once. <laughs> and anyway, luckily they had um, army rations and they had too many of them, which was good because we were stuck there for four days. Wow. Uh, while the storm blew itself out. And, and no one would leave the hut afterwards because they were afraid of avalanche dangers. So Dave made me oh. do it. <laughs> it was all right. <laughs> it was all right. But um, yeah, it just occurred to me that we probably saved their lives, wow. which I wasn't really ready for as a teenager. You know, I would never wow. thought I'd be in a situation like that, but it just happened. So was I this? Think, would you? 
Sorry. I think confidence is everything. You know, if you really confident in yourself, you'll be all right. But if you doubt, you know, it's almost like opening a door and letting death in. You know, that moment of doubt may kill you because it will take all that confidence away. You won't think straight. And anyway, that was my theory at the time. <laughs> and it made you made you brave as well. You you wouldn't allow yourself to think any other way. You know, I don't think I'm brave. Um, you know, being frightened for me is the same as it is for everybody else. You know, being frightened is horrible. No one likes it. And if I had to uh, put up with fear in the mountains, I wouldn't do it either. But it, it didn't frighten me. I understood it. And I trained relentlessly for it. And, you know, I made good decisions, you know, and I was never afraid, really. Hmm. Well, and- it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and that point in you, you know, where you rescued someone, you were, you were obviously young and you were here, you are rescuing, uh, saving people's lives. Was this a sort of a turning point in your climbing career? No, not really. I was too young and arrogant. Um, you know, maybe it was a progressive step in my learning, but, um, no, no you know, I was so full of myself as, 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 as a young man that, you know, I'd almost instantly forgotten about it when we got down into the valley. And I was interested in the next thing, you know, what was going <laughs> I'd always be the last to leave any party, you know, but, you know obstinately um, uh, hoping for, for more fun you know, than, than I'd had already. <laughs> so, uh, so you mentioned a pub there. I think it was a, a fateful day in a local pub in Chamonix when you met a guy called Jack Roberts. And yeah, it was. And uh, Jack persuaded you to join him to climb some of the most treacherous mountains in the world, uh, specifically Mount Huntington in Alaska. Um, mm. And but before you actually uh, got to that mountain, uh, you spent some time in California preparing. Um, how was uh, California, and sort of what was the pre- preparation like to get you fit and ready? Well, um, Jack and I got on really well. Um, we were like catnip for each other in certain ways. You know, we similar sense of humour. Jack was very mischievous. Uh, he was always trying to fix me up with women as well, and you know, I was a little <laughs> bit shy. But, you know, I was only twenty. Anyway, um, so California was was just wonderful. I mean, it's it's different now. I mean, the, the attitude. I don't find the same happy-go-lucky atmosphere in Santa Monica today as I did then. Um, but we had a ball, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd train really hard all day, um, uh, you know, run and swim and go to the gym and then go rock climbing and then hit the pub. We'd do this relentlessly and it was just a fabulous way to live your life. Jack was a very good rock climber and um, quite famous even then. And uh, he knew that I wanted to go to Yosemite Valley. It's the, the altar of rock climbing in, in, in America. You know, it's a 3,000 foot high cliff made of beautiful granite you know it's, it's sunny just paradise really so we, we had a, a great deal of fun and we realized that we enjoyed each other's company a lot i mean we'd not spent a lot of time together uh, just a couple of weeks in england the summer before and as you said um mount huntington became the objective i don't know that we chose it i think it chose itself in some ways because uh, we hadn't really decided on a on a, on a single mountain just an area of alaska where we would go because we knew that there were many unclimbed things there you know like most of it was unclimbed the people who climbed all the summits perhaps but uh, most of the faces remained unclimbed but, um, a british magazine published a, a photograph by an explorer called bradford washburn who's a very skillful aerial photographer and he took a picture of mount huntington it was just that became my North face of the Eiger, you know, I never got to make the first ascent of the north face of the Eiger. Um, some incredibly skillful climbers were in 1938, you know, and I wanted to be like them as a young man. I wanted to have my own Eiger, you know, the, the thing with such a reputation, so hard and so dangerous that it would really yeah, make people think, you know, to, to, to even attempt it. And that became the objective. So cocky were we that, that we ignored all the advice to the contrary that it was too dangerous. And that's where we went. Mm-hmm. So a first ascent, obviously, maybe you could just tell us more about that. But also, it's a massive undertaking. Was there other training that you'd have to do or visualization or preparation um, leading up to such a big climb? You know, some people might today with a bit more science, but basically we just made ourselves animal fit. 
And we were right at the top of that. You know, we could do a pull up on the fingers of one hand. We could run a marathon every day if we wanted to. Um, you know, it was literally we, we were at the top of our game um, wow. physically. No, we didn't do a lot of preparation for it. We had one photograph of it, <laughs> and we were possibly the most <laughs> stupid climbers. I mean, we, when you when you climb in Alaska, you don't walk to the mountains. You you, you could, but it would be an expedition in itself across 60 miles of tundra with bears and moose and <laughs> the worst mosquitoes that you can possibly imagine. So no one does it. You fly in a small high wing monoplane with skis and you land on the glacier with all your gear and you get out and the plane goes away and leaves you there. It's quite lonely and we were completely isolated. Um, we could have flown around Mount Huntington if we'd had the brains to think, well, hang on a minute, we're in a perfectly good aeroplane at 10,000 feet. Why don't we do a couple of loops just to have a really good look at the mountain to figure out that whether our descent route was sensible, you know, all good things like that. We didn't do it. We just landed straight at the bottom of it and made camp. And that <laughs> consequently later in the, in the, at the adventure, the lack of knowledge that we had um, caused us some serious problems. But yeah, we were, we were pretty full of ourselves. Hmm. Crazy. And uh, so just before we get onto, onto that uh, adventure, you mentioned uh, Yosemite and uh, I, th I think you did some climbing there uh, yourself, but a bit of a random question. Uh, what do you think of uh, a man called Alex Honold who, is fr who has free climbed El Capitan? Yeah, I've met Alex since. <laughs> you know, when you write a book, you get to meet all sorts of people. And, um, He's a really nice guy. What you see is what you get. He's just this goofy, easy to get along with guy. Um, I, I fear for him. Um, you know, I really fear for him. He doesn't do those things recklessly, by the way. I mean, he really practices them. You know, he, he, he didn't climb, free climb El Cap at his first attempt. You know, he, he practiced every, every pitch on that thing until he knew he had it fired. But that still doesn't take away from the utter commitment. I mean, if you sneeze or, uh, you know, some minor mishap that you didn't see coming happens, uh, and you're dead, you know, and you'll have a long time to think about dying falling off El Cap because it takes quite a long time to fall 3,000 feet. So, yeah, he's very impressive, um, but I, I worry about him. It, it, it's, I watched his TED talk and I was like, oh, so nervous just listening to him yes. talk about, <laughs> yeah. uh, about it. But, I mean, there must be so much technicalities involved in that sort of climbing. Like, like you said, if you sneeze, you could probably fall off. So the way you breathe and, um, I don't know, just, you know, how you use your body is, uh, you know, is that sort of stuff that you guys did in your day? Oh, it's no different from just, just normal rock climbing. The only, the only, you know, all of those things that you do, the state of mind you get into, the, the way you move, the way that you think, the way you breathe. Um, all of that happens in difficult rock climbing anyway. It's just that we take some protection. And, you know, the thing that's going on in your head is, you know, do I feel comfortable uh, with risking falling off at this particular point? You know, am I close to a piece of equipment that's going to stop my fall? And if I'm not, then I'll think long and hard about it. Alex doesn't have that luxury, you know. He's completely alone. <laughs> He certainly seems like a super nice guy and he's also quite the pioneer in the, in the van life. You know, he's, you know, he, he lives out of that uh, van. <laughs> I think that's common um, amongst climbers. I know many yeah. others that have very nice vans and they travel all over the USA and live in them. And uh, he's just one of those. The only reason they do it in Yosemite is that you're not allowed to spend more than a week in Yosemite. There's a rule because it gets so many tourists that he has to sleep. He has to leave Yosemite every day and sleep in his van outside because if he enters the park, he has to leave seven days later. You know, uh, oh, so it makes a lot of sense. Uh -huh. so, so now coming back to your, your climb, so you, you get to Anchorage and you make your well to, way to, to Talkeetna, Um and obviously this is quite a foreign sort of a place, isn't it? What, what was Talkeetna like? Oh, it's like being in a Western movie, you know, it's, 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 it's just has that Main Street, you know, Western town feel about it. There are more dogs than there are people probably. Um, you know, it's the end of the road, by the way. Tucky you know, was only there because they built a railway bridge over, um, over a river as part of the Trans-Alaskan Railroad. It's got no other reason to be there. The climbers uh, use it. Um, it's got a pub that's been there or a bar that's been there since about 1920 something. It's still standing mm. for, the, for the Fairview Inn. Um, 
and they had live music there every night of the week. You know, the, the Alaskan Bluegrass Festival was on when we were there, and I, I was immediately in paradise. You know. <laughs> There's a roadhouse that's still there; it hasn't changed much at all. You get these huge breakfasts. You know, everything you've seen good about a, a Western movie is is tucky. You know, but, uh, cool. Uh, I, I loved it there, and um, they have an airstrip in, just off the main road. The road, the, the main street of Tucky, you know, is like a, maybe, maybe two lanes wide, but it was dirt. And then at clearing in the trees, there were two a- airports there. One of them is just a piece of grass. And people are taking off right by the side of the road in, in super cubs and things like this. You know. um, so the atmosphere was really quite special. Um, we had a very good time. But I can't wait to go back. It hasn't changed much at all. Uh, cool. Wow. So, so you mentioned airstrips and... and I think you from that from uh, Talkeetna is where you took off uh, to uh, Ruth Glacier uh, hmm. in a tiny Cessna, and I think you had your first sighting of uh, Mount Huntington, um, or or yeah. just one of them. What did that feel like? Well, it was we realised. Well, it, it was awe all, all inspiring. I mean, it, that's an over overused phrase, but um, I can't think of anything else. The mountains are so precipitous. Um, and so impressive. And you're flying in steep-sided, glaciated valleys um, mm. at an altitude which is maybe 5,000 feet lower than the peaks around you. Jeez. So you're really flying in 3D. And mm-hmm. um, we landed on the West Fork of the Earth Glacier and we, you know, we could see Mount Huntington. And, um, our first reaction was the same for Jack as it was for me. That's much bigger than I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> Just feels a lot bigger than, than we'd seen, you know. Uh, yeah, it's five thousand seven hundred vertical feet from the glacier to the summit. Um, uh, unclimbed. Wow! Quite, a, pro- quite a project. Goodness gracious! That's and, either. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it's it a sharp landed the plane. You know, that was exciting. I've never been in a small plane before. Um, and uh, skidded to a halt, and we unloaded the little bit of expedition gear we had. And he, he left us. And, that felt lonely seeing that little tiny speck of a plane disappear around the corner and <laughs> be gone. But a great, it's great. You can't do that in the Alps or anywhere. You can't be alone. You know, just, we really enjoyed the solitude of it. Yeah, and you can't do it in the Alps because there's just so many other people. Oh, well, you're so close to, you know, the, you can see villages from every peak. You stand on top of Mont Blanc, you can see Chavigna, I can see Cormier, I can see Chamonix, I can see Les Uches, I can see, you know, they're all within walking distance mm. almost, you know. So, um, whereas in Alaska, you're alone, this, this, to get to the end of a glacier would probably take you weeks, maybe, you know. Maybe. Uh, and then you've got 60 miles of grizzly bears, moose, mosquitoes, snakes. <laughs> and dangerous rivers full of freezing cold water that wash you away, you know. Um, so really, it's it's a different feeling. It's like being on the moon. Wow, and that obviously adds a layer of of danger, but also ex- I would imagine excitement and and uh, adventure to it. Oh yeah, I mean, climbing in the Alps is fun, I would say, but you don't ever feel like you're doing anything particularly. Might be very difficult, but you don't feel committed. You know, you could. Eat, I mean, North Face of the Eiger is a good example. I mean, you, you're when you walk down from that thing, you know, you're half an hour from a hotel. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're a long way. We're, we're a plane ride away from a hotel. Wow! And did and you have any encounters with, like you said, the mozzies and the bears and stuff like that? Did you ever have no, any of those? No, no but mosquitoes. Yes, I mean they're terrible in the spring. Um, I've never seen a bear, and I'm glad. <laughs> worried about this. They say they won't a grab, the bears won't attack groups of, of four people, but it was only me and Jack, you know, so you'd be a target <laughs> out for some reason. And they're dangerous. Anyway, I've, I've lots of documentaries about bears, but I, I had no interest in seeing one. Or, or I have friends that go, you know, go hiking in that part of Alaska. They always take a gun, and I, I could never take a gun. I could never shoot them. So I just don't go. Mm. And I guess you're pretty conspicuous in your bright uh, climbing gear as well. The bear would see you pretty far away. <laughs> yeah, miles away, probably smell us miles away. Yeah. So you had um, quite incredibly 20 days of snow and bad weather. Mm. 
um, bef- before you had a sort of a window to start climbing. Um, what do you do at the base camp while you sit there and wait? Well, you read a lot. Um, we built this huge ice cave, which was a distraction. The, the tent became useless. It would, it would snow enough in a day that it would, would bury the tent completely, and you know, it means you've got to get out all the time. Unbury it. it means you can't get any rest. So we built a snow cave, a small one at first, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Then it became a condominium with separate bedrooms. <laughs> uh, you know, that was our place to hang out. For a while, we had some visitors nearby. There was a now very famous one. Charlie Porter and uh, his partner and um, they didn't manage to climb anything and they had a falling out and in the end they split up and so on but Charlie was a very fascinating guy you know so we, we would have dinner with each other you know we'd pass the time having conversations but at least it wasn't just Jack and Jack and me talking to each other all the time. we had lots of books you know we'd read, deliberately brought really heavy stuff like Mervyn Peak and things like that you know, things with <laughs> <laughs> and you know, then we'd have our own little book club and discuss, you know, what we thought about them or you know anything. <laughs> Jack actually carved a television set into the ice of his bedroom and would occasionally <laughs> stare blankly at it. <laughs> so, so can you tell us, like, how do you actually build these like snow caves? What, what are you big, using? And a uh, big shovel and um, and your ice axes. You know, it's, the snow is hard enough that it can support itself. Um, but we have a snow saw, so you can actually cut blocks of it out. Huh. And they're very useful as building blocks. You know, you can bat an igloo over, over the entrance. So it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's hard enough that, that it's, it's substantial, but it's, it's soft enough that you can cut it with a shovel. And that's what you do. You just dig and dig and dig and dig. It keeps you fit. And, and is, it like, is it warm inside compared to outside? Like warm, There's I no, guess, is not the right word, but you know what I mean? No, it's not. Um, but... There's no wind, so mm. you don't get any wind chill factor, and it doesn't snow on you. So it's warmer than it would be outside always, unless the sun's shining. So, you know, given that it's nighttime and it's, the weather's bad or whatever, yeah, you're better off being in a cave. Mm. But, but we had very good sleeping bags and foam mats and things, you know, so we could stretch out on the ice, but the foam would protect us and the bag would be warm. So we could sleep very peacefully in there, much more comfortable than the tent. So, and we can cook under it. In, in, you know, we had a kitchen that we built into it. <laughs> cool. Quite civilized. <laughs> <laughs> and and we was it? Would your stuff get wet? It gets a bit. It gets a bit dank in there. And on the first sunny day that we got, the first thing we did was to take all of our clothes off uh, and <laughs> make a, a washing line out of some climbing rope and some skis to let the sun you know dry everything out because mm. you really want your personal gear. Dry before you start climbing because if it gets wet, it won't protect you. And um, the photographs of that afternoon become quite no, no, notorious, I suppose. You know, Jack <laughs> took all of his clothes off, and so I had to see it. It felt pretty good, you know, because the sun's strong up there. It's not cold in the sun, it's hot. Mm. And we figured that, you know, we probably smelled pretty bad because we'd been wearing <laughs> those clothes for 20 days or more. Um, we figured that the ultraviolet might kill some microbes and <laughs> of course good good weather brought other climbers and the plane landed much to jack's indignation because he was sort of <laughs> trying to regard the valley as his own valley you know, you know. <laughs> wasn't pleased to be disturbed by anybody else and well, they'd actually crashed they crashed and they buried a ski and we had to go and help dig the plane out you know, and then we went back to naked sunbathing again <laughs> and while they sort of bells out they, they plotted up on their snowshoes they were headed up past us and higher up the valley for a different climb and when they saw what we looked like you know from, from the distance you know they actually took a detour which must have taken them another mile out of their way just to avoid going near jack and i these two crazy guys running around <laughs> on the glacier <laughs> some, for some reason i don't know what got into his head he decided to put his climbing equipment on you know just the harness and the pitons and the ice axes and i had a picture of posing like a lunatic so, yeah that was him lively spirit that's that's good times and and how, how how do you before you climb up and it's when the weather finally clears how do you actually decide how much food to take with you well you've got to make a decision about how many days food you think you can carry you know it's a question of need and weight food's heavy so you really got to be careful with what you take and we decided that four days food would be enough 
um, we knew that we would go hungry because we certainly weren't going to climb it and get down again in four days. But any more than that, the packs just got to be unmanageable. So we really petted that. Fast and light was the, was the ethos then, you know. We were climbing in what we call alpine style, which means just two of us with what we can carry. And no fixed ropes behind us, no camps, no support, you know, no one behind us, no food dumps, nothing in it. Um, uh, so, you know, our packs were probably 30 pounds, you know, and got lighter as we went, just a sleeping bag, a Gore-Tex bag, and enough food for four days. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. And, and when you're climbing up these mountains, this mountain, like how, where do you sleep? Well, we didn't take a tent because the, the, the mountain was too steep. We knew the tent would be useless. Um, North Face of Mount Huntington is really hardly ever less than 70 degrees uh, hmm. in angle. So what you did, we, we slept in a crevasse the first night. We actually found a crevasse on, on, on a hanging glacier on the face that we could climb into. And that actually saved our lives, actually, because the mountain was avalanching at the time and we were able to hide in there. So that made quite a comfortable place to be, but it was also a terrible place to be because, you know, we knew that we were utterly committed, uh, that we couldn't possibly get down. We'd learned something about the mountain that was that when it snows, it avalanches almost immediately. Um, and other nights we would just chop out a ledge um, or try and make a snow hole. If you could make a snow hole, that was really good. It would be, it'd be quite well protected. Um, but once or twice we wound up just sitting out in the open in our sleeping bags. So a snow hole is literally you, you just dig into straight in like a, at a sort of like 90 degree angle. Yeah, just like a wombat, you know, just straight into it. <laughs> uh, dig, with your, dig with your front paws, push back to your feet. Get in as far as you can. You can hit ice and rock at some stage. When you do that, turn left or right, you know, so you can continue to make the hole that's big enough for two of you. And it's a, very, it's a really good technique. You've got much snow for it. The snow hole's great. It's, it's wow. comfortable, dry, nothing falls on you. It's good. And you're out of the wind. So, so is your head in towards the mountain or out? do you turn around with your head out? or How, how do you end up sleeping? <laughs> well, Jack and I wound up having to make a, a snow cave to avoid another avalanche on the second day. Um, Jack got knocked unconscious by a snow slide. And we had to dig in very quickly to save our lives, to get out of the this washing machine of falling snow. You know, it's, people think snow is not very heavy, you know, but when you, you get enough of it, it's like being hit by concrete. So, so we dug a hole and to answer your question, we had to go in it because we couldn't get in very far. We had to go in and then to one, to turn right. So we made a very long, thin snow hole and I went in feet first and he went in head first. So at least we went <laughs> head to head so we could have conversations. And we cooked in the middle, in between us. So we could, you know, it, it made sense. You know, we put the, put the stove in the middle and, you know, we could talk to each other easy enough. And and how do you actually generally cook on a mountain? Like, how, how do you not let everything fall down and burn yourselves or, you know? Oh, you've got to make a little ledge of ice or rock or something like that, put the stove on it. The stoves we were using burnt stuff called white gas, which is not quite kerosene. It's not quite petrol. It's some, somewhere in between. And they're very hot, very lightweight, but extremely powerful. And, uh, yeah, you've got to be careful. You don't drop things. You know, it's a favorite goofy thing to do to knock the tea over or something like that. Yes, it's, if you can't find somewhere to put the stove, then you'll dehydrate. You know, water's really important. You've got to drink at least four liters of it a day and add that allergy. Hmm. Sam, so maybe you can give us a bit of an idea of what this climb was like, like on the way up before you, you, well, you got hit by an avalanche, a couple, a couple of them by the sounds of it. Well, it was, looking back on it, it was stupidly dangerous. This, this mountain has a, 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 a thing called Serax, and Serax are like huge bits of ice that break off. So when you snow snows on the mountain, it compacts into a kind of ice and then gravity starts to get hold of that and it starts to slide down like a glacier traveling down the valley. Only it's on the side of the mountain and when it gets to the change in angle or anything like that, you know, thousands of tons can break off and fall. And we knew that we would have to climb underneath Serax for the first day to, to until we could get past them. Um, so it was a bit of a lottery, really. The, the climb was technically very difficult at the bottom, too. You know, it was a, a rocky band of about 1,500 feet that we had to climb. Um, and we knew that if we could get past that, that the climbing would be much easier, or so we thought, um, and less dangerous, or so we thought. 
but it turn, didn't quite turn out that way. So you know, we had this major objective on the first day, which was to get a, get out from underneath this this uh, sword of Damocles that was hanging over hmm. us. Um, and we thought that the climbing afterwards would be straightforward, but it wasn't to be that way. Yeah. Uh, we picked out a feature in the upper part of the face, which we called the ramp. Uh, we'd borrowed a name from the north face of the Eiger, which gives us a ramp on the Eiger as well. And I tend to sort of steal all those names that we used. <laughs> and we thought we can get in the ramp, you know, we'd be fine. It was like a road to the summit. Um, but we couldn't really judge the angle. And because we hadn't flown around the mountain, like I said in the beginning, it was much, much steeper than we thought. And uh, we spent four days uh, climbing the north face of Mount Hunt. <laughs> We'd expected to spend two. So we, we eventually reached the summit with no food at all, no, just enough fuel to make water. <laughs> Crazy. And then how do you actually get down? As I can imagine, that's not <laughs> exactly easy. Well, this is the bit that I'm not terribly proud of. Um, we thought that we could climb down the Northwest Ridge because that was the first way the mountain had ever been climbed. And usually the first ascent of any mountain is by the easiest route. It's logical. Turns out the Northwest Ridge is not the easiest way of mountain hunting, and it's absolutely hideous. And in Alaska, you get these incredible snow formations, like huge snowy mushrooms that form uh, on ridges. And you can't climb them because they're not substantial enough to, 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 to get any purchase on them. But they form overhanging and collapsing parts. You know? We started to try and go down the French Ridge and realized that it, it's going to be impossible. We've made a huge mistake thinking that we could do that. So we were forced to take, uh, I actually fell through a, one of these snow mushrooms and injured my ankle. I was trying to find a way around it and it collapsed underneath me and I wound up back on the north face. Um, luckily, Jack stopped me on the rope, but I twisted my ankle quite badly. And I got back onto the summit. You know, we had a little council of war. And well, he had thought that he knew that the west face had been climbed a few times and it had been climbed recently by a Japanese team that had sieged it. By siege climbing, I mean they'd, they'd fixed ropes on make camps and so on. We thought if we could find that, we'd find a way down. And that was all going quite well. You know, we climbed down a, a big ice field and then we found the first few pitons, you know, the other climbers had left behind and started to follow those, uh, abseiling down our ropes. And then we had a tragedy. Um, I abseiled over a huge overhang and Jack followed me. And then when we went to pull the ropes down, they wouldn't come. Uh, hmm. They'd got jammed hmm. and tried as we make for half a day. We could not get those ropes unjammed and we weren't able to climb back up them because we didn't have any gear to do so at that time. So we wound up with not having, you know, 200 and, or 260 meter ropes. We had one piece of about 80 feet and we were uh, halfway up the you know, second hardest route on Mount Huntington. And hmm. in 54 hours, uh, we had to climb down and couldn't rappel down. We had to climb down. Climbing down is really difficult compared with climbing up. And as we went, we managed to uh, souvenir some bits of old, you know, ratty rope, and cut them out of the ice and tie them together. So we said it's kind of a washing line, the knotty rope that we were using <laughs> to get off. Uh, in one push, uh, we got down. We didn't feel like stopping. We just got all the way to the bottom. And, uh, but they didn't really finish the adventure then because we were on the wrong glacier, you see. We, there was a ridge between us and the Ruth Glacier. We were on the Tokositna Glacier. So although we'd survived the mountain, we now found ourselves separated from our uh, you know, rescue or our self-rescue by another, another ridge of 1,500 feet, maybe of ice and rock on we had to overcome to get down to where we'd started. So we were properly tired when we got back. It was about nine or ten days round trip. <laughs> Five days without food. Five days. Like Goodness. What's going through your mind and body when you haven't had five oh. days of food? You, know, you just put up with it. There's no point in, in agonizing over your situation. You can easily do it. If, you, if you're properly hydrated, you can not eat for five days. It's not, not really a problem. Um, I mean, you get pains in your stomach and all of that, but it's, it's not. You know, when you've got no choice, it's easy, isn't it? Um, yeah, <laughs> and we had no choice. Uh, no one even knew where we were, so, so you just get on with it. And, and are you you eating ice or uh, like you know just is that how you're getting yeah, you, fluids in? We, we, 
we'd, we'd, we'd stop for tea if we had, we had tea bags, I think, pretty much all the way down. That was all right. So it was quite a luxury having tea bags. And there's a good thing about that because you can't eat snow all the time and you've got to have electrolytes in it and there's no electrolytes in snow. So if your body doesn't have any electrolytes, it can cause your liver to, uh, to malfunction. Um, so you've got to have some sort of, like you can't drink distilled water either. You know, you've got to have some pollution in it otherwise, or, you know, minerals or something. Mm. Um, otherwise, you know, it can kill you. It's perverse, isn't it? Um, but <laughs> we had tea bags, so we were okay on the electrolytes point. We were just very, very hungry when we got back to base camp. You, you mentioned it a, f- a few times in your book, um, and it, every time I read it, I, I kind of had this vision of how amazing it must be when you say you've climbed all day long, you're super tired, but then you make yourself a big black pint of sweet tea. So it just sounds so like satisfying. With You can just imagine you, you're absolutely parched and the sweet tea is just hydrating you. Oh, there's, there's no drink that you can have in any bar anywhere in the world that's as good as that. You know, and I like to drink it. <laughs> just you know any sort of I wish I had a beer or something you know, but that's for later you know, it's, it's, it's great and, and what's, you- what's the conversation like when you know there's two of you and you've been together for such a long time are you even talking when you're going down um, we were talking when we were going down because we got quite happy you know? um, <laughs> when we got off Huntington we were happy it was, it was the minimum of conversation Jack and I were using telepathy pretty much. He was the first climber that I'd ever teamed up with who was sort of the same as me. You know, he was a slightly better rock climber than I was. And I was probably a slightly better rock and ice climber than, than he was. But it really didn't make much difference. And we were using telepathy most of the time. And it wasn't necessary to discuss what we were going to do. It was just so obvious because we were at the top of our game. And we never really started to talk to each other much until we got we realised that we were going to get away with it. And... Um, you know, then the chit chat started because then we started to allow ourselves to think about, you know, a beer that we got down and what a celebration <laughs> we were going to have. But you don't allow you don't allow yourself to talk like that until you know you've got it in the bag. It's, it's just not, yeah. not good luck. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. And, and wh- why has uh, no one attempted this climb again? It's stupidly dangerous. Um, we had some advice from a very famous climber called Brad Washburn, who was an Alaskan pioneer and. He took the picture that we'd seen and he, he made the comment that he thought it was too dangerous ever to be climbed. And I think he's right. Um, mm. We were extremely lucky and unlikely to get away with what we did. And, um, my climbing friends that I know today still shake their heads. Uh, as did I. I went back and looked at the 2015 stand up. It's still cycling dangerous. It probably, probably will never have a second descent. Wow. Which I'm happy about, actually. I wouldn't want someone to get killed repeating it. I'd feel terrible um, mm. if that happened. It was okay for me to be stupid about it when I was 22 or whatever it was. But, um, you know, part of me quite likes the, the fact that no one is ever going to climb it, that I've done it. <laughs> A little bit older and wiser now. I don't make that sort of stuff go to my head. Yeah. It must be kind of cool, I guess, thinking that, you know, there's other climbers around the world who sit around the campfire and, and speak about these two crazy guys who try to climb this <laughs> one once upon a time. Yeah, I guess I do. You know, it's, for people in know Alaska, they, a lot of people looked at it and for a long time, refused to believe that anybody had climbed it. You know, we had a problem with credibility because it just seemed so unlikely that anybody would be that, you know, that crazy. But um, we did. And I'm glad we did, but it just emboldened us, really. You know, it, it, it got away with this huge gamble. And, you know, we were very skillful and obviously very resilient, um, but we'd gotten away with it. And Jack and I felt like we could do anything um, hmm. in each other's company. You know, we, we were so such a good team and so good with each other, you know, total trust. I mean, you know, I wouldn't go that far on a limb with anybody else you know, hmm. that I'd ever known. He was so dependable uh, and he felt the same way. That's cool. Oh. It's nice having that sort of friendship and, and bond with somebody. So flying back to Talkeetna, uh, you had a bit of a bittersweet moment. Uh, what was your main emotion flying back after summing, uh, summiting Mount Huntington? It's, um, it's, it's a bit strange. You know, we, I hadn't spoken to anybody else pretty much but Jack for a month or so, yeah. 
and then suddenly you find yourself in the space of 45 minutes, that's all it takes, to fly from the Ruth Glacier to Takitna. Um, and there you're back in civilization, if, if Takitna can be called that. Um, and, you know, nothing's trying to kill you anymore. The, you know, it's not cold anymore. You can do whatever you want. But it feels too, it feels too sudden. It's mm. too abrupt. It's not like that in the Alps because you're never away for very long. You know, an alpine context a few days, and you can see the valley all the time. You know, I think I, as a young guy, I used to hold the record from descending from the summit of Mont Blanc to being in the Bar National. You know, I could do it every <laughs> day. Um, so you never felt that that isolated, and it took a day to get used to it. Um, it felt strange. I guess it's the, there was no. <laughs> preparation for, for, for easy street you know, which is what, what I and you'd you'd sort of felt that there you'd kind of put one beast to rest and but there was another one sort of in the waiting in the wings well you know that's who we were you know you'd, you'd do something like that and you, the first thing you'd think of is well after you've had a few beers and something like that well, what's next yeah. um Jack and I went climbing at that time for the same reason I discovered only in retrospect. You know, we were out there to outdo ourselves. You know? So whatever we'd done yesterday, we had to do it 1.5 times tomorrow. Mm. And we started immediately to, to plot alpine-style ascents on, on Denali. Um, but I had, I had an ambition that I just had to put, which was the north face of the eye here. And I realised sometime after hunting that the only way that I could do that now would be to climb it in winter because the summer ascent just wouldn't cut it as, as, as an achievement. Much, much harder to climb in winter. Hmm. And that became yeah. my next ambition. And which you ultimately conquered, which is, which is another amazing story in and of itself. But two years later, where things really got intense, you were back uh, in, uh, uh, t- you know, in, in Alaska uh, to climb the tallest mountain in the world, the huge diamond-shaped Denali, as you just mentioned. Why mm. did you want to climb Denali, and uh, what made it different to Mount Huntington? Well, it's much, much bigger. Um, Mount Huntington's only 13,000 feet high, something I can't remember the exact altitude. It's, not, it's a smaller mountain. Uh, Denali's 20,320,000 feet high because it's so close to the Arctic Circle, um, the stratosphere is much closer to the surface of the Earth um, than it is at the equator. So it's very much like climbing uh, a mountain that's five or 6,000 feet higher than that, perhaps, you know, in mm. terms of what it does to you physiologically. And um, there was these two massive faces on the south side of the mountain that had never been climbed. So in a typical fashion, you know, all of the ridges have been climbed. Um, and then one face, uh, and then but all the hard stuff was on these two faces. They're very steep. Um, give you an idea, Yosemite Valley, which you must have seen a picture of, the highest mm. cliff in Yosemite Valley is 3,000 feet high. Mm. The bottom half of the southwest face of the valley, which is a cliff, is 4,500 feet high. Jeez. And then there's another 5,000 feet of climb up to that. <laughs> Snow and ice. So it's really a big... It's much, much bigger than Everest in terms of it's not as high as Everest, obviously, this confuses people, but from the bottom of the mountain to the summit, it, you know, it's fully three or 4,000 feet higher than the biggest place on Everest. And we wow. decided that we would, we would make the first ascent, the southwest face, and we would do it in Alpine style, just two of us, with no backup and no expedition to support us. Just that was the style to aspire to. That was considered to be the impeccable style completely committed to your adventure without the support from other people. Oh. <laughs> I, don't exa- I don't know exactly why we tried. I mean, it was obviously such a step. You know, we'd seen pictures of it. I'd, I'd seen, seen it from the aeroplane in the distance. I went, you know, wow, that would blow everybody away if we did that. <laughs> we really set the cat amongst the pigeons if we did that. And there was some of that in, in our thinking. Of course. Although I think we, we, we really sobered up in a big way when we got to the bottom of it. <laughs> we knew what we were doing. We knew what we were doing, and we knew what, what risks we were taking. That's true. It, it's so interesting. Like uh, I, I like I, I'd never heard of this mountain in my entire life because normal people just hear of you know Everest and stuff, uh, but but people that are not like mountaineers and stuff don't 
generally here of Denali. And also then finding out that there's actually a difference between the tallest and the highest mountain is also pretty interesting. Uh, just yeah. from like, someone from my perspective, at least. Yeah. I mean, it's not something you think about every day, I guess, is it? Um, yeah. Alaska is, is, a, is a really special place um, for mountaineering. I mean, the Himalayas are well understood. I think, but despite the ease of which you can get to, you know, to get to Denali, you hop in a plane and it takes 45 minutes and you land mm-hmm. on a glacier at 7,000 feet. Okay, you've got a couple of days' walk to get to the bottom of our, of our climb from the ski. But the approach is really easy. And that appealed to me enormously. You know, asked me why, why, why Denali? Well, I could have gone, you know, I climbed the Arga in winter, so the next logical thing was, well, you've got to go out there in the layers and do something really big. Well, no, I much prefer Alaska because I don't have to walk two weeks from, from villages and, you know, and, I don't have to put up with a base camp and too many other people. I don't have to employ any porters or mm. any of that governance that comes with it. You know, all this baggage that comes with climbing in the And so, well, we go to Alaska. You know, Jack was the perfect partner. Um, he knew the way. He knew the area. Um, and that became our choice. You know, it was, it was a, a daring thing to attempt. But it was also quite easy to get at it. You know. mm. The approach was easy. That helped. I'm incredibly impatient. <laughs> you know, I, I really don't think I could bother to, you know, let's go and climb, you know, Changa Bang or something. How long do you take to get there? Three weeks. I'm not interested. Got to Alaska. And, and it's also quite expensive to climb, like, the Himalayas. Is it yeah, also yeah. the same in Alaska? No. I mean, well, I mean, you've got to have your gear, so your personal equipment. I mean, bear in mind that, you know, Alpine-style climbing is really cheap. It's just all, all that you can carry with two people. That's mm. it. So there's no, you know, supplemental oxygen. There's no base camp tent. There's no nothing. You know, you've just got just that bit of gear. So personally, you're not spending a lot of money. Um, and getting a flight into the mountains then was about two hundred and fifty dollars. Was it <laughs> there and back? You know, the pilot would fly you in and come and get you for two hundred and fifty bucks after you've done the <laughs> climb. Or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's heaps more expensive to go to, to, to the Himalayas. I think. Cool. So, so maybe we can move on a little bit onto the actual climb. Uh, so things were going fairly well um, up until a point that, that Jack sort of started having some bad blisters and you were getting tired and had some headaches. Uh, these were the first signs of the cracks that uh, were showing. Um, is that right? Yeah. I mean, we, we had a pretty good first day, uh, you know, bearing in mind that, um, the approach had been traumatic. We nearly got killed by an avalanche in the valley of the glacier leading up to it. Um, so that was so good. Um, we'd met two other climbers, which was to be very fortunate later on. And they were going to climb a, a climb called the Cassine Ridge, which was parallel to our route, um, our unclimbed route. And, you know, we got up early and pushed off on the first day. And we climbed about 1,800 feet, which is not bad for a day. So packs were heavy. But Jack hadn't told me that he'd had some frostbite the winter before. And mm. because of that, he was trying some newfangled crampons that, that <laughs> didn't work quite as well as he thought. And it was causing his heels to lift inside his boots. He was getting shocking blisters. Mm. Um, uh, and the climbing was much harder. You know, it was heartbreakingly difficult. Some of it. I mean, it was a pitch <laughs> on the second or third day that I nearly fell off. and would have killed both of us if I'd fallen. Um, you know, it was just hard as I've ever climbed anywhere in the Alps. And, this is all going on at now at 16,000 feet, so higher than the summit of, of, of Mont Blanc by a margin. And all the air is also much thinner for that altitude anywhere. And you're doing the most desperate climbing in, in crampons with a pack on. Um, and eventually, we, we fought our way up to um, this huge boulder. There's, there's the biggest single bit of rock I've ever seen in my life. It's right in the middle of the rock band. It must be must be 500 feet high, you know, by 300 foot wide. And it's just one solid block. And wow. underneath it was this big, flat, snowy ledge. And <laughs> I found this thing and it was like, uh, the best bivouac you could ever have. And we were able to put our tent up and get really comfortable on a completely flat ledge. We weren't in any risk of falling off it or, you know, completely protected from the wind, a little alcove there. And we decided to spend a couple of days. And it was there that I first sort of got the first nagging symptoms of, Altitude sickness, which are headaches, lack of appetite, you know, vomiting maybe, 
Um, and, you know, while I was sitting still, it wasn't too bad, but when I was exerting myself, it got worse. And, you know, looking back, I mean, there was no way we could get down. We knew that after the first day or so that we wouldn't have enough equipment to repel down the route. You know, we, to, to get down by sliding down ropes, you've got to leave a piton or something behind to attach the ropes to. And we didn't have enough of those to get very far because they were heavy. Um, so we knew we were going to be absolutely committed, but it's still at that stage it felt very hopeful. Um, you know, I helped Jack with his feet and we had a nice chicken dinner or something. We dehydrated food, and um, we had a, a pleasant, a pleasant rest there. Really, I suppose you could say, but um, we had to leave it. Uh, you know, it's like being on the moon. Really, you know, you you might feel perversely. Uh, happy about sitting in your space capsule, but you know you've got to get off the moon at some stage. <laughs> That's what faced us. We couldn't wait too long. I, I can't imagine the feeling of knowing that you've you've passed the point of no return. Like you actually can't climb down from here, so you have to climb up. I mean, is that just part of climbing, or is that something you have to kind of really um, that, make a mental <laughs> moment of it? You know, that, that's your choice. I mean, some climbers are never prepared to do things like that, and I don't, I don't disagree with them for feeling that way. You know, but um, we wanted the big prizes, and that meant making that decision. You know, that there would be a, a cutoff point that you couldn't reverse what you were doing, and um, we were prepared to do it. We were confident enough in ourselves that we, we could see it through. Jeez. Now you mentioned uh, a moment ago mountain sickness. What is the difference between mountain sickness and high altitude cerebral edema? And, and did you start to have um, all of those sort of symptoms relating to the um, cerebral edema? Well, they are all related, you're right. Um, altitude sickness manifests itself, first of all, in the form of a headache. And what's happening is that your brain craves oxygen. And in an, this is a very poor description, but um, basically the 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 parts of your cells of the outer part of the brain swells up to increase its surface area so it can assimilate more oxygen. And that gives you a headache because you, you've got a swelling in your brain and that you know, feels like a headache. Uh, cerebral edema is the extreme uh, end of that swelling process where the intracranial pressure, you know, the problem is you have a skull, so a certain amount of swelling will actually crush the cortex and you'll die. And along the way, the symptoms are, are progressive like you can find headaches followed by vomiting followed by um, loss of balance or ataxia or, or com complete exhaustion inability to talk um, and, and then death and the only way to reverse those symptoms is to descend immediately to a lower altitude and that wasn't an option for us so it then became well we didn't know what was wrong with me Jack was fine but um, uh, we made the only other choice that seemed sensible it was, was, was hightail it to the summit as fast as we could, knowing mm. that once we'd crossed the summit, the west buttress of Denali is just a walk by, by comparison. You know, it's, it's a serious climb, lots of people get killed on it, but I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a snow slope um, that you can walk down pretty much. You know? um, and we knew that we would encounter lots of other climbers if we could do that because the west buttress is the popular way. Um, but I got very ill and um, you know the onset was gradual at first and then relentless and um, we managed to climb through all of the difficult rock climbing sections and we were exhausted so we bivouacked um, found a place to put the tent up um, above that and took a rest day there as well hoping that I would acclimatize and, and get better but you know people know a lot more about cerebral edema now than than they did then, and we did nothing about it. In fact, just once you've got the onset of those symptoms, you will not apply the plans. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's a one-way street, and it's, it's all getting worse. You know, being up there is not helping you um, to get over it. It's making it worse. And hmm. um, we managed to get all the way up to about, oh, like I want to say, 18, 7 or 19,000 feet. And we reached the Cassine Ridge, which was the climb that our two friends had been planning to climb. And... Uh, I collapsed. I uh, couldn't even sit up. Uh, I was taking a, I was sitting down taking a picture, and I said, "Jack, I can't get up." And uh, he tried dragging me, um, 
and we crawling, you know, trying to get the first thought was, oh, come on, we can crawl over the summit of Denali hmm. uh, and get onto the easy ground. But it, I couldn't even do that. So we had to put the tent up and we wound up staying, staying several days in, 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 in that spot. Um, him with the onset of really serious frostbite and me descending into uh, near coma moments. Um, we hadn't eaten. Uh, we'd run out of food a couple of days before, so uh, we were not only cold and eat very ill, but also starving. Hmm. And, and, and were you, like, coherent at all in this state? I remember bits of it, um, but the answer is no. I don't remember all of it at all. I look at the pictures and I can, I can recognise myself in them. I was able to write the book only because Jack was one of I mean, All Americans seem to like to write journals. I don't know, there must be some that they're trained to do in school or something. Like and um, <laughs> we all do it. All of my friends do it anyway. Um, <laughs> and he wrote about what was happening and he was tearing himself to pieces, um, not knowing what to do, whether to stay with me and die with me or he tried to drag me over the summit again. That didn't work. And he, he had the most awful dilemma for him to... to to stay there and we'll definitely both die or to try and go for the summit on his own and get down the other side and alert anybody, uh, you know, maybe to be able to organise a rescue. Sounds good when you say it, but the reality is that there's no one who's ever going to rescue me. You know, the people who climb Denali have enough trouble getting to the summit, let alone back down the other side you know, to, to hmm. help somebody. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So Anyway, he didn't have to... Sorry. Yeah, you know, he, he, he carried that around with him for the rest of his life, I discovered, you know, that, that, that time. Um, and um, he was fixing to, to leave. Um, he left me with the stove and, you know, my personal gear in the tent, and he was going to go for it himself. And just at that moment, he was uh, relieved from that awful decision because um, Bob Candy and Mike Helms turned up. These are the guys that we've met mm. lower down. And they'd been even slower than us. We thought they'd be long gone on the Cassine Ridge because it's not our hardest to climb we'd done. But they, they turned up and found Jack. And uh, we all sat down together. They had some tea. And I remember somebody giving me some tea and this conversation that went on about me. And the decision was taken that Jack would go with Mike over the summit because Mike had been over the summit before and knew the way. And that Bob... Possibly the bravest decision I've ever seen. Volunteered to stay with me. Um, now bear in mind that Bob was severely worried about his own well-being and survival long before he met us. You know, he had a reasonably tough time on the casino, and they were looking forward to, to, to getting out from under the, the, the risk themselves. And Bob, to do that, you know, to, to stay behind to save the life of a stranger was the most extraordinary. Human act, and and you, I think you mentioned in in the chat I listened to that he gave a note, was it to Jack to give to his family? Yeah, he, he wrote a note to his parents, um, just in case, uh, explaining what he was doing. And um, Jack also had a note in his in his diary in his his journal that I must have dictated to him because we found it uh, years later. And it was a list of my girlfriend, my parents, my best friends, and, uh, and their phone numbers. Hmm. Just in case, you know, I was never heard of again. So, oh, it's as close as you can come, I think, to, to, to dying and then not. So. Sure. So, so you, I mean, you can't even imagine the, the feelings that, that obviously Bob was going through, uh, Jack. I mean, everyone is there for you and you are sort of incapacitated to do anything about it, which is also really tough on you because you, you know, maybe you weren't with it at that point, but it's obviously has its impact on you not being able to help. Um, but they, as you mentioned, had their diaries and I, I guess it can't all be, all be easy to read. How, how was it for you to read their diary entries oh, later on? It wasn't easy at all. <clears throat> I mean, particularly Jack's diaries, you know, he, he was tearing himself to pieces psychologically over what was going on. Um, Bob, you know, fortunately they all wrote, so I don't have to imagine what they were thinking. I know what they were thinking because they were telling themselves every day. And, um, you know, um, 
um, help us in, in, in remarkably logical, but clearly didn't want to die and had clearly embraced the fact that he might. And this was as close as he'd ever been to dying. I mean, we all, apart from Bob, everybody came away from that time with some kind of post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, hmm. of one kind or another. Hmm. Um, Mike Helms, because he felt that he hadn't done enough and carried that around with him for the rest of his life. Jack, I know, would speak of this on a monthly basis. You know, it never really <clears throat> left him. Um, you know, I, I don't have any crosses to bear because I survived, but I have a feeling of gratitude that I can never mm. relinquish. And Bob, of course, wound up being the hero because he was the one who saved my life and, and got us all the way down the mountain. So he came out of it unscathed relatively, I suppose you could say. Um, mm. But it was a hell of a time. And we, Bob and I spent 10 days together without eating, um, climbing down that ridge. And my head cleared. You know, we made the decision that no one was going to come get us. And I couldn't stand up. So what he'd do is he'd lower me sliding down on my butt, you know, in my windproof pants. And when I got to the end of the rope, I'd put my ice axe in the snow, anchor myself, and he'd climb down and he'd do it again and do it again and do it again. Luckily, the first couple of thousand feet on the Cassine Ridge below us was not difficult. We could make progress like that. The immediate effect on me was very positive. My head cleared. Um, not in, you know, immediate, it wasn't like a moment, but you know, over a day or so. I found that I could stand up again, which was very handy. Um, and I could tie knots and I could, I was a very good technical climber and I could contribute, you know, the rigging and abseils and so on. And then we had a bit of luck. Um, we found the other can of gasoline. On the way up, Bob and Mike had found two cans of gasoline for the stove. And we found the other one on the way down, which meant that the one thing that was surely going to kill us was dehydration. You know, that problem had gone away. We had enough fuel to melt enough snow. And the next mm. problem was the electrolytes. So we started digging up garbage from the previous camps on the Cassine Ridge that were mm. used tea bags, or uh, we found a, a, a container that had some sort of goop in it. We don't know what it was. It might have been jam, <laughs> or whatever it was, but it was sweet. And if you just put some of it in the tea, it, it gave you something, you know. And he was also giving me what I thought was medication. And years later, I <laughs> once proudly said, you know, I don't know what context it was, but I said, I've never taken a recreational drug in my life. Here and, why. and Bob pulled me up. He said, well, that's not quite true, Simon, is it? <laughs> what do you mean? I said, well, those things that I was giving you on the Christine Ridge, I said, yeah, they were like vitamins or something, wasn't it? I said, no, no, it was sweet. And, uh, he said, I'll give you two, and I'd take one. And we'd be good for about five hours, you know, of activity. But then you had to make sure that we had the tent up at the end of it because when you come down off that, you know, we were just completely wasted. Uh, <laughs> so weak. We were burning the candle at both ends. Um, we survived a big storm on the way down. You know, I thought the tent was going to blow to pieces and it all be frozen to death. But somehow we managed to keep putting one foot in front of the other. And <clears throat> on about the 10th day, um, I was rappelling a little rock band um, and uh, Bob was above me and he starts to shout at me, you know, I can't quite make out what he's saying and he's pointing and he's very excited about something. I turn around and look behind me and um, there's an illusion there and the illusion is a tent with four guys and it's a very convincing illusion. Um, it was true, you know, we, we'd, we'd come across another party of climbers and hmm. I nearly slipped off the end of the rope, though. One of those guys had clipped into me and caught me. I probably could fall onto my death. But they were so good to us. It was an expedition called the Freaks, which is an acronym. Everybody has to have a name for an expedition in Alaska. It isn't funny. Ones. These were Freaks hang on far out, I can't remember, environmentally aware climbers or something. It, it, <laughs> it, it, um, it was a, an acronym for that. They took us in and we destroyed their expedition by, by arriving in that state. Um, they gave us a little bit of food, which was agonizing. You know, you've got to be careful when you haven't eaten for a long time what you eat. They only had a Mexican dinner, which was really spicy and really oh. caused me a problem. Um, and we descended with them for the next two days um, until we could get down to a thing called the Hanging Glacier, which was a, it's like a, it's not flat, but it's not steep either. It's like a big snow saddle and about 14,200 feet. And it's quite warm down there and the air's a bit thicker and, and 
Bob was able to run after another expedition that we could see in the far distance. And it was a Japanese team and we knew they had a radio. And Bob caught them and got to use the radio. His great fear was that the Park Service would have notified his parents that we were missing and they would be going through terrible anguish. Um, and, you know, he was never more happy. I, I don't think I've ever seen him after he'd made that phone call basically to, to, the, to the Park Service. And he came back up and I, you know, I said, what, what are we doing? And he explained, he said, I've ordered lunch. And um, <laughs> he explained he, he got hold of the, 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 the ranger station and spoken to them. And he said, they're, they're coming in with a helicopter uh, and they're going to food drop us. And I told him he didn't want to be rescued because that was an option. And I went, yeah, that's right. We, we've come that far. You know, that, that now I could, I could see that we could, we could get off the mountain by ourselves. And I didn't wow. want to be. And the food arrived, you know, the helicopter hovered overhead and they threw duffel bags of dehydrated food and cheese and nuts and you know, all that sort of good stuff. Mm. Fuel and um, Gatorade and you know, all that stuff you want. Uh, and we, we spent the whole day eating. And, uh, <laughs> relaxing. and the next problem happened. I took my boots off um, and I oh. haven't taken my boots off. You, you have inner boots and outer boots. So I never bothered to take my inner boots off. Why would you? you know, they're nice and warm. But, um, I have dainty feet, so I don't feel the need to, to, to take shoes off. And things. And, uh, I had an immersion injury, which is like trench foot, and my feet swelled up like melons, um, oh. being mistreated like that for weeks, uh, so badly that I, I couldn't hardly even put my boots back on again, and the pain was excruciating. It was like being electrocuted through your feet. I'd get these oh. attacks of the nerve ends being attacked. Um, you know, I was back oh. crawling again just when I thought I was home free and um, oh. I put up with all of that for the next couple of days. And we climbed down to, I think, about nine or 10,000 feet and then we picked up the Japanese fixed ropes. The, the very steep part of the Cassine Ridge is the first bit and the Japanese had fixed it with these ropes. Beautiful job they'd done. It was like a highway in the sky. But <laughs> we descended the last three, 4,000 feet in. Half, a, half an hour, 45 minutes or something. And wandered back or crawled back for me to our igloos where we'd left our skis and we spent the night there. Um, and then in the morning, uh, Bob and I decided that we'd best set off as soon as possible because we'd run out of food again. And um, we didn't want to get any weaker than we were. And if the weather got really bad, you know, we would just have to go anyway. And that's what happened. There was a whiteout the next day. And on the glacier, the way that you travel is, is that someone goes first and then you tie the rope to each other and you, you ski one after the other, but quite a long way apart. So that if somebody falls into a crevasse, um, the second person will be like a counterweight, you know, be dragged through the snow and with a bit of luck, you'll stop the fall as the rope cuts into the snow. And I was just following along, you know, the, 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 the snake of rope in front of me would move and I'd stagger after it, you know, I couldn't see where we were going. I was just following the rope, hoping that Bob knew better than I did. And suddenly the rope went tight, and then mm. really tight, you know, and I was jerked off my feet and dragged through the snow, you know, um, you know completely. I was trying flailing with my arms and trying to stop myself. I'd been dragged through by some great, great irresistible force. So Bob's obviously fallen. Mm. And that's the last thing I remember. Um, uh, I know afterwards that I cartwheeled past him and I know that Bob landed in a very deep snowdrift and post-holed himself up to his chest just about wet snow. And I went straight past him on the end of a 150 feet of rope and into a crevasse and fell, mm. you know, at least 100 feet into a crevasse. Jeez. And I must have bounced off the sides a few times as I went in. Uh, I might have broken the wrist, the collarbone, a big smack on the head. Uh, I eventually woke up upside down, um, counterweight with my pack, you know, turned me, inverted me. And uh, I had to get myself the right way up because all the blood, you know, you, you can die from, from being in that position. And I managed to right myself out. I tried to use my right hand at first, normally, you know, very powerful fingers and found that I couldn't use it at all because the wrist was completely smashed. <laughs> I managed to do it with my left hand and by using my ice axe just to pivot myself around. And taking the true horror of the situation, I mean, there seemed to be no bottom to this crevasse. And I knew that the other person on the end of the rope, whoever he was, because I didn't know who I was or who he was mm. at that moment, was probably going to join me in here. And that would be 
the end of us uh, if something didn't happen. And the bond, well, <laughs> was good for me because um, <clears throat> we'd made such a noise in the fall that some climbers nearby had turned around out of curiosity and run back up again to see what it was. And they were close enough that they got to Bob in a reasonably quick time and were able to, to pull me out by, you know, climbing down in there and attaching another rope and getting a pulley system going. Four strong guys, they were able to pull me out of that crevasse. Um, mm. I met one of them um, in 2015 in Olympia near Seattle. And he walked out of a crowd at a, at a slide night where I, Bob was talking uh, to, to an evening of you know, climbers entertainment, I suppose you could call it. And he walked out of the crowd and said, Hi, I'm Steve Friddle. Do you know who I am? I went, Yeah, I know <laughs> who you are. <laughs> you know, with a name like Friddle. You, know, you don't use it. You know, Friddle other than that. He said, Yeah, I was the one that pulled you out. I was the one that pulled you out the crevasse. So, it was nice. Wow. Yeah. Jeez. That's. Uh such a sort of turn of events like you kind of you know it, it's the worst nightmare then you start making your way down and you think you're sort of home and dry and then that happens and uh yeah you get you get rescued again like so, something was on your side that's for sure <laughs> yeah and, and 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 what happened like when I, i'm assuming you got uh, reunited with uh, jack at some point and and how was that well um I consented to being rescued at that point. Uh, they're like, okay, that's enough, you know, come and get me. But the weather went <laughs> bad and, and it was a big snowstorm and they couldn't get a helicopter in there. So in the end, Ranger Dave Buchanan, who I've since met, um, came and got me with a sled and a whole bunch of volunteers and they dragged me into base camp, which is about 15 miles away. And as soon as the weather cleared, I was given priority because I was the sickest and most injured person along with a German guy that had very bad frostbite. Um, and we flew out. And I didn't know where Jack was. I, I, knew, that he'd, I knew that he'd gotten down, I think, um, because we'd had some information. Um, well, Bob had had some information when he borrowed that radio that uh, Mike and, and Jack were off the mountain. But I didn't know where he was, um, and I didn't know how he was. And um, I found out um, because I was simply because I was put in the same... Uh, hospital room with him there was a room for four beds and i was wheeled into it backwards after i'd been cleaned up and x-rayed mm. and, you know and i was shoveled in and there was jack um uh, deeply deeply troubled jack you know, and, uh, mm. he didn't know what had happened to me either and um the state of his feet for me was was a shock he had really bad frostbite he didn't lose any toes but he very easily might have um and to see me all smashed up and broken and not able to stand you know, the, we called our expedition rather humorously the too loose climbing expedition. <laughs> a bunch of guys that we really, we really liked the year before. So too loose it's, it's typified how Jack and I approach life and climbing in those days. But the spirit of the team had taken an awful beating. And, uh, it wasn't meant to be like that. Mm. You know, we only just survived either of us and we'd almost been forced to part ways on top of the tallest mountain in Alaska, you know, and, um, and were it not for the most amazing good fortune, it would have ended very differently. Mm. It's incredible. I just like, you're just on the edge of your seat, just uh, like listening to these kind of stories. But you know what, when you're talking, uh, I, I can't help but be in awe of how tough the human body is, <laughs> you know, like the fact that you actually got through all of that, you, I mean, your feet, your, your, you bumped your head, you'd already had cerebral edema. Like, I mean, how is it even possible? You know, if you don't want to die, it's pretty hard to, 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 to give up. You know, it's, humans are pretty tough. You know, if, if you don't want to die, you probably won't. It's, it's, wow. You know, unless, you know, you really, really, really run out of luck. Um, yeah. And I never quite did. And the bond between the climbers that were around me, you know, is one of the great reasons that I'm alive today. You know, people yeah. behave in a very honourable way. It um, would have been too easy to save yourself. Um, but Bob didn't think that way, and, and that's why I'm here. You know? um, and it was wonderful to be in touch with him after all of those years. You know, I, I walked away from climbing. 
1981, I suppose. But I, mean, I had no choice initially because I was so banged up that you know, I thought of going climbing as well because mm. for a long time. And then I realised that I didn't want to. You know, I, I, I achieved everything I'd set out to do. I, I pushed myself until I found the absolute limit of my abilities. And <clears throat> to go and try and top that, it would have been cluelish and suicidal, I think. Somebody had it right. One of the American climbers that contacted me um, <clears throat> uh, and helped me a lot with uh, some of the research of the book and finding people and so on. He said, look, you know, I used to climb with Jack Roberts and if you two had, had jogged over the summit in, in good health, hungry or otherwise, and you hadn't got cerebral edema, you would have gone to the Himalayas the next year and killed yourself. And he's mm. probably right. You know, we, we were in that kind of trajectory. We weren't mm. doing it for fun. Wow. Had you ever discussed that with the, all those events with Jack properly and really, you know, come to some kind of a deeper understanding or how did that, you know? Sad, sadly, no. Um, when in, I left hospital, I, Jack checked himself out first. And I spent one day with him in Anchorage, but he was obviously deeply troubled. And I said, well, let's go back to California and deny I want to stay here by myself. And I said, okay, yeah. I know where I'm going. I'm going to Australia. You know, I'm going to go somewhere where it's warm and dry. That's so I left, and uh, I didn't see him again until the next year. And that was just good luck. He was in the French Alps with a guy called Jim Bridwell, who was a very famous guy. And we had dinner together in, in London uh, with my now wife, and um, you know it was awkward. Uh, but we spent three months, he, he came and stayed with me and um, well, eventually stayed with some friends of him because we had such a small apartment. But uh, he got a job in the same climbing store that I was running and, you know, we, 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 would, we would spend time in each other's company. But we never really did resolve it. And I think he was hoping that, um, that he, I would agree to go on another expedition and that would somehow um, be cathartic and put it all behind us. I wasn't, I wasn't going. I never saw him again after that. Wow, that's so sh that's so sad that you never never saw him again after that. Um, but uh, but I think you did become good friends with uh, with his widow Pam. Um, yes, I, I I found a friend of mine um, <clears throat> that I go hiking with. Um, he likes to Google people. He Googled me, but I, n I never really Google Google anybody really, but. He found out that I was a mountaineer previously because he'd found a book that I'd talked about in. It's called Surviving Denali. And uh, he knew all about all of that. And um, he sent me uh, a link to a website just out of the blue one day, and it was turned out to be a climber's blog. And I, I didn't know that climbers had blogs, but they do. And <laughs> um, I discovered that Jack Roberts was looking for me after 32 years. I thought, my God, he's alive because I, I just assumed that he was dead. You know, I couldn't find him and then gave up looking because I didn't want to, to find someone who was no longer with us, you know. And um, I got it wrong. I, I, I found the, the blog where he was looking for me, but about two hours later, I found the rest in peace message. Just killed him. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I went looking for Pam um, and we've become good friends. Um, We've made the best of it. She's still grieving. Um, mm. But I've written a, a good book, I think. And, um, you, know, you can't take the history away. Mm -hmm. Wow, Simon. And, and you know, you, you speak about, um, yeah, the, the bond, and this is one of them. Maybe tell me what you mean by the bond. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's the unbreakable connection between Jack and I. Um, but equally, Bob Candico and I, you know, when you face such travails, such life-threatening situations, and you behave so solidly towards each other, I mean, there's, there's, there's a connection there that, that can never be part. And I see it a lot in, in serious alpine climbers. I mean, they go out of their way to help each other and they have respect 
to what we do. Um, you know, sport climbing on a cliff with bolts, in a lycra or something, that's not generally particularly popular. But you know, it's, it's in serious alpine climbing, which is life threatening. You know, climbers feel close to each other. And it's very easy to fall into a conversation with someone you hardly know. Mm. Um, and um, understand you know, who you are. Mm. It's, you see it with offshore yachts, when I'm sure to a certain extent. You know, I took up cave diving, and I have many friends that, that, that I went cave diving with years ago. And, you know, we, 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 I can see one of them after 20 years, and it's just like it was yesterday. <laughs> in that time, you nearly got stuck in that cave. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what it is. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a very good thing. And Simon, was, was there a, a void in you uh, after you stopped climbing and, and how have you filled that up? I was disgusting. Uh, I felt so bad about it. You know, it, it just, I had to reinvent myself. You know, I was Simon the Climber since the age of 13 or something and then, you know, I was nobody. And because I chose to cut myself off from it, you know, I didn't want to be reminded of it. Obviously, I had my own PTSD to some extent. So I, put, I didn't read a book. I refused to look at any program that had climbing in it. You know, I just totally put it away. And it wasn't until really that I got back into um, cave diving. I, I did a lot of cave diving when I was very young. And, um, and I got back into it in Australia. And I found a, a group of you know very powerful friends, uh, you know, more bonds, um, and we discovered the biggest. Uh, flooded cave in, in New South Wales and discovered the biggest cave on the Australian mainland by, by scuba diving and digging underwater. <laughs> but <laughs> that game went the same way and I, I stopped in the end very suddenly because I felt that I wasn't going to get killed, but I felt that I was encouraging a lot of other people to do things that they perhaps didn't understand as well as I did. I, felt. Um, I couldn't bear the thought that I'd encourage some young you know, university student to take up cave diving that they perish. So I stopped. I wanted to be a, a, a good example for you know this. Mm. It. it seems funny looking back now, but I just felt that way at the time. Um, somewhere in there I discovered work. You know, it, uh, <laughs> a, a, a career eventually learned. <laughs> yeah, so, so now my risk taking is, is, is really confined to business. Mostly. Well, the old offshore yacht race gets the, gets the blood racing sometimes. We went to the Philippines a uh, year before last and it was extremely windy all the way from Hong Kong. We got there a day early, but I don't know, I don't, I've never been that fast on a boat in my life. <laughs> we were doing, we were doing 20, 20, 27 knots for almost half a day in a 46 foot boat with a rooster wow. tail, you know, 20, 20 feet high behind the boat. Just incredible. Wow. But the concentration was just exhausting, you know, if you could only helm for about Half an hour before someone else would take over, you just can't concentrate like that. Mm. I'm driving That's a Formula crazy. One car. Wow. wow. <laughs> we, we actually um, are releasing a chat soon um, uh, with someone who was in the uh, Earth race, uh, which was running off bio diesel. And uh, it's just fascinating. It's another world, really, to, to be boating and, and yachting and these kinds of things. It's, a, it's also quite an extreme world. Mm. Well, it can be. I mean, I think it could be anything. You want to make it. So can climbing. I mean, climbing in the sunshine in the Yosemite Valley, with, you know, not like Alex, with, you know, with the rope and nice safe equipment. It feels all under control, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. So tell know. us tell, tell us a little bit about your, your current business, Illumination Physics. What do you, what do you guys do? Um, we're unusual in the lighting business. Uh, we're a manufacturer of, of specialist lighting equipment that we design ourselves. And we like big buildings, simple. You know. uh, plenty of skyscrapers in Hong Kong, and uh, we all want to be outdoing each other for cachet and for image and brightness and whatever. Mm. So I was very lucky in 2003, I wrote a report for the government here about lighting tall buildings. Uh, that report turned out to be a light show, which uh, they have every night at 8 o'clock. Yeah, and it's been going mm. on for all that time since uh, 14. We realised that there was a great business to be had in lighting big buildings, you know, casinos sometimes, commercial buildings, hotels, those sorts of things. Wow. And um, 
Peter travels a lot. My partner, there's just the two of us. And, uh, but I spend most of my time in Hong Kong, which is near the factory, uh, near most of our customers. But that can be quite risky. Uh, you know, you're taking on jobs that are multi-million dollar projects. And if you're late, you know, there are penalties every day, you know, tens of thousands of dollars if you don't deliver on time. And it does. Mm. So it's not without risk. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes those financial risks seem like a uh, harder ones to take <laughs> than the physical ones, that's for sure. So, so Simon, uh, we'd like to end our podcast off with asking a specific question. Um, and what does being ridiculously human mean to you? I wondered about that. You know, I didn't know you were going to ask me that, but I'd, I'd been thinking about the name of it, and I, I think Bob Candico sums it all up. You know, the guy that would take a decision just when he thought that he'd got himself to safe to put himself back into the most dreadful danger to help me, you know, that that's what ridiculously you know, mm. occurs to me straight away, you know, that, that he could do that. And it's, wow. it's magnificent. Yeah. It's no brainer, really. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> and so, so, Simon, if, uh, if people do want to sort of find out a bit more about you, because obviously you've written a fantastic book, um, is there a specific way for them to get in touch with you uh, for the book, um, for, I don't know, events or talking or even just for your business? Ah, look, Facebook's always good. I, I, uh, I use it a lot. Um, I used it initially to better find people, but it's a very easy way to find me. Um, mm. So if anybody wants to find me, I'll respond. You know, I get letters from people all the time that have been inspired by the book or just enjoyed it or wanted to say something or knew somebody that, that was on the fringes of that story. Uh, I've connected with hundreds of people that way and it's been great. So yeah, by all means, great. find me on and, Facebook. And what are your plans moving forward? Have you got anything specific that you're working on or that you can talk about at the moment moving forward? Um, in terms of business, there's always a plan. You know, we, 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 mm. we you know, I'll be 63 next week and uh, wouldn't mind being a bit more comfortable than I am now. Um, but I'm going to go cave diving again. I started to work on a second book, which I think it's going to be called Far Enough. <laughs> and it, 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 it's more of a, uh, an autobiographical work than the last memoir. And um, in order to do some of the research that I feel that I need to do, I need to go cave diving again and some of my friends who I was diving with in the late 80s are still doing it. So I've got no excuse. They wow. take me off to Janolan Cave in New South Wales and we're going to go and dive the, the um, Janolan Underground River, which is one of the easier dives, but one of the most beautiful ones to photograph. So I've got to get in shape. I need to lose about six kilos and uh, I need to start swimming, training, and that sort of stuff. So, uh, <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, see where it's, we'll see where it takes <laughs> me. Um, I say cave diving is also one of those things that's like, that's super scary. <laughs> There's been some crazy movies on that. And actually, you know, what's actually so funny. I was reading um, a, an amazing article yesterday on the cave dive, the cave rescue dive that they did for the, the boys in Thailand, that soccer team. Mm. Oh, it was incredible. The story, like, I don't know, went into serious detail, like more than you would have got on the news and stuff like that. And truly phenomenal rescue that that's for well, sure that's a magnif magnificent achievement you know i it's a cave diver myself i understand exactly what they were doing and, and they were so professional it's beyond that i mean i was agonizing at that two weeks now. i'm just <laughs> had this awful feeling that, that someone was going to get killed and unfortunately it happened you know there was just mm. too many people in the cave at the time and to be a cave diver you need to be a very special type of person you know you really need to have a head on in, in a particular way very methodical approach to equipment and not that sort of equipment that a lot of people were using um, but the guys that got them out i, I, I have friends who, are, who know them uh you know that i've still got in touch with all my cave diving buddies so there was there was almost a virtual campfire every day with us all logging on and looking <laughs> at, you know, oh my god you know hurry up it's going to rain hurry up you know get them out and the fact that they got them all out is not totally surprising what is amazing is they got them all out alive which is hmm. uh, incredible 
I thought, I thought it was incredible that they sedated each one of those boys uh, before they, uh, while they were under the water. I mean, they were, I was like blown away by that. Looking, looking at it, you know, it's the only way to do it. I mean, it, you have to be so quiet at the Cape Diving. You can't fall breathe quickly, you can't get excited. You know, if you're the sort of person that gets disturbed by something, you know, how are you going to go with a 13 year old boy? Mm. So they put them in full face masks. So it's not mm. like a scuba mask, but you, you know, scuba here where you have the thing in your mouth. It covers your whole face. And they're very pleasant to dive with. Um, and it means that their whole face is dry and um, they can manage them. But yeah, they gave them Valium, mm. which was never mentioned in Thailand because Valium is regarded as being a, a date rape drug, a date mm. rape drug in Thailand. Wow. So it would have been shameful to have admitted to ever have taken Valium. It's one of the obscure things that came out of this story. But they were also sedated uh, as well. And in some of the pictures, I could actually see them managing different types of gases. You could see that they were mixing oxygen with air at different stages mm. in the dive. Um, so professional. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, wow. So we're talking about... Made, they all got one anyway. So. Yeah. It's incredible what what people can do when, 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 when they're under the pump and need to get things done at, and work together. It's quite incredible to... To see that, but um, well, talking about the human moment, guys, isn't that when you think yeah. about the guys that volunteered to go and do that? Tell me about how yeah. they would have felt for the rest of their lives if they'd failed and lost one of those kids. Mm, how would wow. you live with yourself after? <sighs> Goodness, yeah, they don't even want to go there. Yeah, well, talking about incredible people, Simon, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure chatting to you. Uh, your book was literally one of the better books I've read, and, and we both really enjoy reading. And uh, it just had me enthralled uh, from beginning to end. Uh, I would be lying if I didn't tell you I had a lump in my throat on more than one occasion. Just um, obviously today the chat, uh, there's a lot more detail in your book about what you went through and the emotions and the some other finer details that are both funny but also even scarier than, than, than what we spoke about today. So uh, we really encourage our listeners to, to check out uh, your book. Uh, thank you for for just you know being so open and honest uh, with your telling your tale um, because you do just you know it's it's so inspiring to hear what people are doing number one but number two to hear the kinds of stories that come out of extreme situations is just a a great illustration of what we're all capable of so um, just thanks so much uh, from my side and uh, uh, have your we look forward to seeing uh, you know your your second book when it when it comes out. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, and just briefly from me, Simon. Uh, thank you so much for for sharing uh, your journey and journeys and taking us uh, you know through these climbs and, and and the things you experienced. I can can only imagine that it was probably ten times more scary than <laughs> you explained. <laughs> um, and uh, for for normal people like me, that's for sure. Um, but it, it's amazing that the world needs people like you uh, to to do these things that that other people wouldn't. Uh, so that we we know that uh, you know we we can try and and push ourselves. Maybe not just in mountaineering, but in other parts of our life. And and I think that's important uh, for people to explore so that they can grow in in different ways. So uh, yeah, your story was amazing. Um, and I definitely look forward to the the cave diving book um, because uh, <laughs> that uh, that is also another sort of treacherous sport. But your 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 chat was amazing, and and thank you so much for for everything that you have done as a human. That's for sure. You're welcome. You're yeah, welcome. cool, Thanks. great stuff. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy cape fold, mountain range. Gotta be quick.